Hi Siobhan. I am very excited to be giving you a portfolio critique today and the way that this works is I will go over your whole portfolio first with my first impressions and then we'll go through each piece individually and finally I can give you some advice about what I think about gallery representation and how you could possibly move forward with that if you would like to. What I really, really love about your portfolio is the kind of narrative you're working with. The intimacy of each image, how you want things to be small because you want people to look really closely at them. You're, the details that you're picking out are very particular and they guide the viewer in a particular direction. And I think that makes your your storytelling and your images really unique and draws the viewer in and has just enough of that mystery in there that it's really fun to try to complete the story with the details that are missing. You're very good at showing only a little bit and letting the viewer kind of extrapolate from that. I also like how you are collaging images together. Some areas this is working really really well such as the the boar's head on the table with that light streaming in and others I feel like it is not quite there such as the bird on top of the text, the red text in image 5. I can go more into depth about that later but I think that you have a really strong sense of of storytelling, of the feeling of objects of preciousness, of places as well, just from your first and second image to your 10th and 11th image, you have a really strong sense of being there. I think this is really helped by your handling of lighting, your handling of lighting and your understanding of tonal range. You have a very wide variety of tones in each piece and I think that really helps to bring the image alive especially when you're working in such a, I'm not going to call it quite photorealistic style, but almost film style. This is, this is really helpful. I think a lot of filmmakers that are working in black and white have that same kind of attention to lighting that you do. I'm thinking a little bit of Alfred Hitchcock in particular because you've got that horror quality in there, that uncanniness, uncanniness in particular, like with the that mammoth skull. Like, why is it there? Why is that light shining on it right there? But you also have this sense of the traveler, of mythology, of even maybe the occult. I'm noticing in your writings and your collages, it really makes me think of the story books by Nick Bantuck called Griffin and Sabine. And those books use this collage element of different painting techniques and photos and text all combined into one image. Then those are like little postcards. He's making little postcards and letters. But these collages and what's in the collages kind of contributes to the overall narrative of the story. And I'm seeing that a lot, especially in images three through six. So let's get into these individually now. The first two in particular, this one and this next one right here, they really remind me of Monet's cathedral pieces where he's he paints this cathedral over and over and over. You've probably seen them. It's like the haystacks and he's using different color variations each time to demonstrate different lighting situations, like what is summer lighting compared to winter lighting, sunrise versus sunset. These two images are actually the only two images that I really see you playing with nuanced color. You don't really use color a lot in your work, and that's fine, that's totally cool, but I think it's interesting that you have only used them in these two images like this, and I, I wonder why. I really love the way that this purple, this there's this purple shadow in here that creeps across, and the way this is so dark, you can feel 
as a viewer, like sinking into the space, like it's really deep and intense. There's that, I think that's ultramarine blue, and then there are little touches of it here and here. And I think that really contributes to the, the detail, like these aren't particularly super detailed. I mean, you have a little bit here and here, but you're really good at suggesting having the eye finish the piece, which is really successful. Like we see this little hint, yeah, like right here, but that's only a couple of marks that you're doing and you totally, you're barely suggesting it here and then you totally lose it. But my eye is continuing that into there. I feel like I'm falling into that space, which is working really well. Maybe it would be useful for you at some point to make real objects out of these. Like, I don't know if you do any 3D work ever. It doesn't even have to be 3D necessarily, but you have such a tangible quality to these pieces that maybe going that extra step and like making some of those, those objects that you would have in your cabinet of curiosities would take your ideas with having like particular things, a curated set of things, an intimate set of things, and push that even further. I really love the color palette in this image. I think that that kind of copper color and the green color work really well together. This is again, one of the only images that I'm seeing like a, a successful use of, of color palette and a really regimented curated use of color palette that I think is working. It has this kind of old effect to it. This feels like a textile to me with these leaves here and the leaves over here. I kind of want to see more, like what was, what if this was continued into a wallpaper? What, I feel like this piece is part of like a larger set of pieces. I could see you doing a hundred variations of this with like maybe different images put on top and different types of patterning in the background. Like I could see a book of wallpapers almost. That's, that's the thing that I would really like. This piece would be better in a series of work and doesn't necessarily stand on its own so much or there's not enough information there for it to stand on its own. I make the connection between the leaves and the leaves. I get the birds and it's kind of the old, old feeling pastoral kind of scene, but I don't get much beyond that. I want to know like what it's a part of, where it would stand in your cabinet of curiosities. This image as well, I feel like this is part of a larger series. You have like this really nice dark blue against the screen. What does the text say? Does What does this mean as a part of your image? I think you use text a whole lot in your pieces and in some places it works really well and in other places I'm wondering is it just put there for a decorative effect? Something you might be interested in is looking at visual poetry. Maybe you look at visual poetry already. Or shorthand, which I can't read shorthand. Symbols that look like they could be alien but are also legible to some people. There's also another term, I don't remember what it's called, but there's a practice in visual poetry of making text that looks like it would be real, like readable, but, but is not. This is used in painting a lot as well, where you have text. Text in painting is so hard to grapple with because you want the text to also function as a mark. Like if it's just text, like you can, you just like read it and don't read it as part of the painting. You just immediately go into reading mode. And I don't think you have that with this because I can't actually read the text, which is good. That's great. But that boundary or that weird kind of turning point between what is legible text and what is a mark within a painting is really interesting to me and something that I think that you could definitely push a lot. Look at how this mark here or this mark here echoes this mark of the boat. These kinds of things are really interesting to me. This piece right here is a bit more successful than this piece. This is beautiful text. Is It's beautiful handwriting. And the bird is just glowing. It's gorgeous the way that this really has this backlit effect or the spotlight effect. This really bright, bright silhouette. 
the the lighting is really good and your your sense of tone again is really strong but this bird doesn't necessarily connect with this or I'm not getting any story that I can decipher out of this looking at the Griffin and Sabine books would be really good for you because there is a lot of that use of objects, of images, against text. And there is like both a color play, but also a narrative play. And I think that that's something that you could go more towards or get a lot out of. I would love to see you take this effect right here, where it's so highlighted and ghostly almost, like it's almost like a spirit, and use that in your other work. I'm like really torn about this. I feel like this is almost there. Like I see this woman looking, having this eye contact with this bird, the symbolic looking silhouette of a bird. Her face is being viscerally ripped apart by this red bit here that could be an abstract mark or it could not be. My eye is like constantly moving and constantly shifting gears from one type of reading to another, which I think is good. I'm not focusing too much on the eye here. I'm not focusing too much on the text or on the verb. Like everything flows really well, especially like down here as well, where this also reads as a texture that flows up into this, this frame here. You need one more layer to kind of bring it all together. I think the blue helps like making it all the same tone, but I almost need like a little bit of sparkle or something here to keep me from falling off the edge. I guess. My area of interest is really in here, technically speaking, and it's really easy to kind of get stuck like right here and then just fall off here. This is probably your most successful out of these word collage type pieces, and I really think that even though this is your earlier work, you should keep going with this end of things. The longer that you're working on and the longer that the series gets, the more complex and involved they'll get. This piece right here, I really want to know what medium this is. I can't actually tell. I want to say that it's some kind of graphite or painting, but I really can't be sure. Your use of cropping in this is probably the most effective part. Again, you're falling back into this dark, dark, dark space. It feels like there's a lot of space around this person or the statue, but I'm wondering like what is being cropped out here. I have this little suggestion right here. I think that's something that you could use in your work, especially in something like this, where you have information that's withheld. Like you could have information that's withheld here in the same way that you have information that's withheld right there. If this part wasn't there, it would read completely differently it would read as more of a solitary kind of thing, like having her very solitary, and I wouldn't be wondering what is going on over here. This one is one I feel like the tone got the best of you a little bit, or maybe it's just the photograph. I'm not quite getting enough information about what is going on or how this text connects with this figure in the same way that I'm getting that satisfaction with this. If you just varied the tones a little bit more and gave me a little bit more information about what's going on here, here, how this relates to this, I would feel a lot more satisfied with this image. However, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but these corners are so lovely, the way that they're like slightly lit up. And I think that maybe that is something that you could use in your other pieces as well. But where is she going? What is she doing? That is something that I want to know with this. I love the way that these are so brightly lit up feels like three spirits almost. They're just drapes on a window, but they also function as so much more than that, which is something that I'll get into with your other pieces that are along this, this narrative here. 
maybe drawing interiors or going into people's houses and picking out certain snapshots like this would be really good for you. This reminds me a lot of haunted house stories as well. It reminds me of the book House of Leaves, which is about a house that like grows and shrinks and is it's not necessarily like haunted, but the inside, the amount of what's on the inside is not reflective of the size of it on the outside. Maybe reading some of these books would fuel your choice of imagery. But again, just the way that these are highlighted, almost like bones, they feel almost like vertebrae. And these have like a very visceral kind of quality to them too, while being ghosts. I think that's really cool. An artist that uh, you might want to look up if you're interested in ghosts is Ed Penn. He, or Payne, he does more installation stuff, but he also does some painting. He did a whole series of spirits and of talking about spirits, showing spirits in different, in different ways, including ways that weren't necessarily like figurative. That really follows with this quite nicely. The text in this feels like little scratches or almost like it was etched into the surface with acid. And I think the harsh quality to that, where there is almost like the sharp outline around these things, something that you could play with more. This mark making that doesn't feel like a handmade mark, it feels like a chemical type mark. I think that that could add to your work as well. It's working really well right here. This is one of my favorite pieces. I think this is so great. It's so uncanny. You have this boar's head, which is like this feast image. It can be either, the boar's head's really weird. It can be either a very friendly image or a, a very scary, uncanny image. And because you got so in depth with the detail here and then let a lot of things go as far as the detail goes, like this melts back and these kind of melt into the shadows. And you've got just the slight bit of color that's touching it. I think that works really well in your favor. Maybe you could collect real objects and work from those. This choosing of objects thing seems like something that you're interested in. This is also a really strong piece. In particular, I love this. I love that it's this crazy like mammoth skeleton in the middle of this alleyway. Like it's so weird. Why is that there? Why is it lit up by this light? But also I just want to point out, this is where I feel like your text is really, really working for you. I can't read what this says, but it's, it doesn't matter to me in the sense that it's, it's well incorporated into the picture and I want to figure out what it means if it connects with the mammoth thing. It flows really nicely with the narrative. It's like almost like a clue. I feel like I'm a detective or something and I'm trying to figure out what's going on down here. What are these little pieces on the floor? What does this say? Why is this out here? So, and again, like your sense of space is just very, very strong. And this is, I could see this piece huge and being really, really successful as well. I feel like I want to see this right here, the text right here, to be more incorporated like this, where it's not, this is not bright at all. It's just on the edge of the frame where, and this is spotlit. You have the spotlight right here, but it fades out over here and it's it feels not consistent with your text right here. This feels like it was just written on top. Now it'd be one thing if you wanted it to glow, I feel like you could soften the edges around it a bit and that would help if you wanted it to look like it was glowing, like say on like on the one ring. This reminds me of text on the one ring, but that was like lit up with a kind of fire inside it. And I think like maybe that is an effect you could add to this and have that feel like that if you wanted to. This area right here, especially with the shadow back here is very effective. I get that sense of space. 
I kind of get like uneasy looking at this like one spotlight as if there's I'm like in an alien movie and the alien is like coming through the doors up the stairs or something and it's before that thrill moment but I lose it right here this is this feels kind of flat in comparison if this is a doorway I would love it to meld into the dark darkness more like this or have at least not as sharp an edge right here the way this is sharp is fighting against the light of this, especially since you've kept this nice and and fuzzed out and blurred out a little bit, but the but the lighting is still intense, so I'm kind of having this back and forth here and there. So overall this is mostly working. Like the composition is really good. There are like a couple tweaks as far as lighting goes. This is the first time I'm seeing you use color as a statement. I think it's interesting that you're using red, especially since you have that kind of horror or macabre quality to your images. I think red is the natural place to go, but red is a really, really hard color to use because it's so strong, it's so intense. I'm wondering if you dulled this just slightly if it would be more effective. Like in some of your images, like right here, I get like the teeniest sense of color down there and down here. That is effective enough. It's subtle, but it's effective enough. And I think this is almost overdoing it a little bit. Again, like red is the go-to, like I'm not surprised to see it there. It's almost pulling away from what's going on in here, which is much more subtle and much more interesting. I feel like when you use like a single color and you're working within black and white and you're putting in that one color, the color has to mean something. The contrast has to mean something. There are several movies and books that you can read about this. One of my favorites is Chromophobia by David Batchelor. He talks a lot about color and why it's used where it is and what that meaning is behind that. He talks a lot about the movie Pleasantville, which is a black and white movie and the color gets added in slowly as the movie goes on when the people in Pleasantville become more human and it represents sin but also humanness and also he talks a lot about uh, the book Heart of Darkness and Apocalypse Now because color is also very involved in that in this whole transition from black and white to color especially since you work so narratively this is something that could be really useful to you. This is actually the image that made me think about you using different objects, creating your own objects rather than just drawing them. You have such a caring attention to these details, the way this is kind of drawn out here. And I can read this, the bride standard. But then you have this up here where it's suggested that there's stuff going on, that there's ornate detail in this. The imagination is left to figure out what this is. I kind of almost want to see all of these objects created in 3D and placed like this or placed within a diorama or something and see what you come up with. A lot of painters and people who make drawings especially will make dioramas and create all the little objects in them and then draw them. Having that diorama in itself is so precious, especially in terms of your use of interiors and stuff. I think that that could be another direction that you go that could be interesting. And finally, we have this piece. I feel like this piece is like the boar one a little bit, except you're grappling with that, that color issue. Like you have the animal that's like kind of creepy. It's not directly threatening, but it's really uncanny. But then you have this really, really bright red. And this is, I understand it being kind of this like zap at you. But I want to know again, like why it's red, why it's there. Does this represent like blood? Is it red because it's like rage or sin? Or I'm thinking about all of the emotional qualities behind the color red. It's a little bit distracting, especially when you have like all these details out here. Like I only just realized right now that you can look out into this little area and see these lights and see a street. And I think that's so amazing back there. But I it, you know, I've been looking at this image before this talk for several minutes, and 
I was just totally caught up in this red. So again, it's like maybe toning it down or making really, really deliberate decisions as to why use that particular color and why there. Because right now it feels a little bit like it's fighting. I'm really excited by what is going on here, and I'm glad that you're having some success with getting some shows and things. As far as uh, gallery representation goes, I think if you really want it, you should go for it, definitely. But I don't necessarily know if it's going to help you have more time with your artwork. And I say this because when you are making work for a gallery, to have in a gallery, you still end up having to do a lot of legwork with making, with administrat administrative kind of tasks. So you're still going to have to come up with your price list, you're going to have to make connections with collectors, it's not just the gallery's res responsibility for that. You'll have to keep up these connections, you end up like shipping a lot of pieces, and just from personal experience and talking with uh, a lot of other artists, this takes a lot of time, and this takes away from the time that you are going to actually be making your pieces. And that's not necessarily bad, because one of the things that it does do is it gets rid of that awkwardness of, of trying to sell artwork yourself. Like, I know very few artists that feel, like, comfortable talking about the prices of the work. You're not making artwork to sell it necessarily to make money. You're making it because you like making artworks. That business side can get like a little weird and awkward and personal and the gallery does a lot to help you out with that and get around that because they handle all that transaction stuff for you. Between selling things yourself and having a gallery sell things, that doesn't necessarily change the amount of time you're going to spend in doing like administrative like legwork and heavy lifting, you'll still end up having to do a lot of that. What the gallery scene does help you do is it will help you get connections to more people. You'll have like a big family of artists. It's good to have that, that marketing experience definitely. And you can have the chance to go into like other venues that you might not otherwise have done, such as art fairs, for instance. Do that. I think that you have like a very strong personal style and that's good for you that is really to your advantage you want to look for a gallery that has work that has a similar kind of tone towards yours or look for curators who have similar tastes to you talk with those curators don't market your work right off the bat don't do any of that just pick their brains go to those shows that have tastes similar to yours talk with the people there talk with the gallery owners get a feel for it and come back over and over and over again and really get to know these people and you'll find after doing this a while growing the relationship naturally that you might have those opportunities for showing your work with them or meet artists or other curators that are willing to show your work in other places, which could then lead to gallery representation. It requires a lot of patience and just waiting it out. You approach it obliquely almost, I feel like, where it's really about like those relationships first. And then you get into this trust where you're like, okay, well, let's try a show of your work. Let's work together on this. But I think that is a place that you could go if you want to. You want to take the time out of creating your work to go do that because it is a priority that does take up a lot of time, just like making the work takes up a lot of time, and that balance can be really hard for some people. I am really excited about where you're going with this stuff. I can't wait to see more of what you're doing. I want to see all of these things that you're exploring just like grow and grow and grow. I am so happy to be able to go over all this work with you, and good luck. I hope you let us know how it goes.